Hello, 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 everyone. I hope you are well today. That you're having a good day. That you're feeling inspired, ready to understand better values, colors, temperatures, composition, brushwork, and all these kind of crazy concepts which are going to make your work look better. So let's go for it. So we're still on this horse rider. He accompanies us since I think uh, three streams now. So we're gonna try to finish it today, hopefully. So last time we were we were starting to work on some details because as I said uh, earlier, it's always from general to specific. So now that the general foundations are here and now we just need to zoom in a little bit and start to refine each shape. Let's go, I'm taking the reference and we can start. Don't forget to check the navigator here, which allows you to see the work in small. So basically what this does is like when you're stepping away from your work to sit from far, to have a general view. So I'm going to let it here and just check it from time to time. So as you see, I am adding more and more complexity to the shapes. Before here, it was only a kind of big red triangle. And now I'm breaking this triangle into smaller surfaces, which are the folds. So in painting, you should never be too hurried. You really have to take things step by step, following a certain protocol. Otherwise, you might end up in trouble at some point. And taking things step by step can seem long, but... Yeah, painting, it's a, it's a slow medium. You cannot push it more than what it can give. Here we have some bounce light from the cape. See how I'm squinting from time to time to see which value I laid, see if it's dark enough. Today we're also gonna talk about edges, which are a really important part that I didn't cover last time. So we're gonna cover it today. And edges are linked, very linked with values and brushwork. So I can't wait to tell you more about it. So here I'm really only laying the shadow shapes more precisely. All the different brush strokes, texture, blending will come afterward. Right now we're just delimitating, I think you <laughs> spell it this way, the shapes. And after when the shape is defined, we will work on the edge, on the contour, on giving some cool variety in the brush strokes and all these kind of things. But once again, we gotta be patient and take it step by step. So refining more and more the shapes. And you see, if I if I de-zoom, if we step back, the pen starts to have some details, some folds compared to the horse. Look at this part of the horse. It seems so, so sketchy, so blocky. And that's what we want, taking a blocky shape and break it into thinner blocks and thinner blocks and thinner blocks till we arrive to something which looks detailed and finished. Here you have the shadow of the cellar. You see at first I really did just a big shape like this because when you're blocking the drawing you're basically you know putting accents here and there like that just to get the dark parts and structure but now we zoom in this structure and we give it the true shape that it has. This is a cast shadow from the cape so from the cape the shadow casts a certain form. You know in painting I always uh, it's always for me a little how to say it, the, f the fun part come after all the construction is done because then you can really refine and, and that's when the, the beauty starts to appear. Edges basically is containing lost and found. Let me actually find the windmill principle. It's a great example which is gonna make you understand in a second. So the windmill principle is sometimes you have a found edge, meaning it's a light value against a dark value. So you see the edge seems to be cropped and these lows the, the object to come forward sometimes is the same but the way around for the values so you have a dark value on a light background and sometimes you have a dark value on a dark background and a light value on a light background and here the edge gets lost because the two values are so close one to another that the dark is gonna melt 
within the dark value around it and same for the light and playing with this is gonna help you to give depth to your painting as well as um, integrating what you're doing with the surrounding you see because the the windmill here is having a lost edge the windmill is entering the his or its environment and because it's having a hard edge here the windmill is also popping and getting separate from the background so edges are a great trick to unify and at the same time to separate the important parts that needs to pop here you see we have a strong edge here the edge is lost this value and this value are close one to another so this edge is blurred the same here between this and this, the edge is blurry. And then you have another found edge here and another one here. So playing with edges is really important. It's gonna help a lot to densify your painting. So hopefully that was a good example enough. And on our rider, typically here, we have the value of the horse and here the value of the cape. And this value and this value are quite close to another. So we could blur the edge and have a lost edge and you see that it doesn't put any problem on the readability of your work i just lost this edge and you can still totally understand that the cape is sitting on the horse back on the way around here you're having a dark value against a light background so you're gonna have a sharp edge and this way the rider is gonna come forward compared to the background right so then you can really have fun trying to find where you can lose the edge where you can find it here the same i lose it here i'm probably gonna lose it because this even though it's red and purple it's really close one to another so i could just lose the edge and you see it's totally fine it even creates some connections like the rider really seems to sit on the horse because this lost edge is it's like glue it's gluing both elements together so here we have this portrait from rembrandt right the hair here and his armor are very close um, in terms of value so because it's close in terms of value we're gonna we're gonna erase the separation between these two values and just group them in one see i'm flattening up this part i'm grouping it because there is no sense in separating them if the guy was wearing a, a white cloth you could separate it because the two values are so different than that it needs a separation. But here it's closed, so you just join both values. On the way around, here it's a light value against a dark value. So your edge is gonna be strong. And then you have what we call blurred, blurry edges. It's for instance, from here, from the bottom of the jaw to the cheek, you're gonna have a progression, meaning that the form is turning. So when things are turning from dark to light, you are going to have a half tone between both and it's going to be a soft edge. So to remember, light against dark equals a strong edge, okay? Let's call it strong edge. For this, you're going to blur both edges. So this is a lost edge. And then when the form turns, meaning that you have a really progressive variations towards two things, that's when we're going to have a soft edge because shad uh, the, um, the form is turning towards the light. So it brings a, a soft gradient. So this is going to be a soft edge, sharp, lost, and then soft edge. Hopefully this is clear enough. And if you have any question yet, yeah, just let me know. Just let me know. So it's all about values in the end, you see, I was teaching a workshop this morning in Thailand, an online workshop to Thai University of Art in Bangkok, and I was stressing this out. I was telling them how important it is to think in terms of value, because value gives you color sense, it gives you three-dimensional sense, it gives you information about the edges, it gives you information about depth, about everything. If you control where your values, you're good to go. And here we're not blurring the edges yet. We'll do this afterward. But if I was about to do it now, you see, I would just blur the transition here, soft edge. The same here. All this is a form which turns. This fold basically is doing like this. Then there's a crease, then a bump, then a crease, then a bump. On each bump, if the light comes from here, it's gonna be lit here. And here you're gonna have dark and a soft edge because it's transiting towards the light. Let's put it here. 
and this helps to give 3D a lot. If we check Charbal <laughs> Charbark Charles Barg drawings, he, this is even clearer. Okay, so these are plates which were used in the 19th century to help students get better. And because once Jérôme, the French painter, and uh, Barg, uh, they were called by the French Academy to, to help step up the, the level of the students because the Academy judged that the students are not good enough. So they called these two artists to somehow uh, train them in, in, a, in a particular way. So Barg did, did all these plates for students to copy them and hopefully, yeah, make them make them uh, increase their level. So Barg basically is telling you with such a drawing, you group the values into one dark, then you have a light value, which is here. We're gonna compress it, taking off this grain. And what he says is that in between this light and this dark, because the form turns, remember what we did, whoops, with the, um, the bump of the fold, if the light comes from here, here it's dark and the more you go towards the light, the more it's lit and the less dark it is. There is a gradient from dark to light. It's the same here. We're gonna have a half tone in between and that's it. And we draw anything, for instance, something like this. You want to place your dark and then when you turn towards the light, then you're gonna have this soft edge appearing right there. See, it's as simple as this. And because here it's light, against light, you can lose the edge like this and leave just a part. So you have this effect of light coming. And if the background is uh, gray, actually, then you're gonna have the, the edge found again. And what can be cool here as an effect of light, uh, let's do this straight so it's less, uh, it's a less sketchy. Then you could say that to give the impression that light is strong, if you want the, the light to be like, <laughs> I don't know how you could spell this in English. You can do what Rembrandt does. He's using this value and he just lights in the background. And you see here we're glowing, that's the word. Straight away, we have a glowing effect because what the glowing effect does is that it says that this part is so bright that it's gonna illuminate what's around. So if the value here is like this, if you burn the value behind, then you're gonna have this glowing effect, right? Zzz. <laughs> Here you're gonna have some reflected light, of course. And Rembrandt uses this like a lot. Let's go and check something from him. See how the light here from the window is burning what's around. It creates a smooth edge and it's not as dark as it could be. Okay, this is a very good example here. So you see, Rembrandt here could have decided to do this like Caravaggio, I go dark and everything is dark so that my figure pops. But because Rembrandt is more interested into the effect of, of light, this golden gl uh, glow, he decided to burn the value of the background. See this value here? If we turn this into black and white, this, is, this part is lighter than this part, right? You see, here it's dark, here it's light. So be, because he said this part is so bright, it's so strong in terms of light that it's gonna act like almost like a lamp, like a secondary light source. And then everything that is around is gonna be lighter. So this is something that you also can use in your work to give it a glowing aspect. And if we're in the Rembrandt painting and this part is dark, look what happens if we enlight the value on the back, you suddenly start to feel that something is happening with the light, like the light is atmospherical. And then you can put a really strong accent here on the, on the edge. And then here you're having a really nice effect of, of light glowing. See what I mean? So that's one option that you can use. Back to our writer. He's been waiting for quite a bit now. See, I've been using tech brushes that are having a little texture. So we start now to also add consistency in our strokes, not just bold, flat strokes. Yeah, it really starts to be consistent. Here it's light where, it, where the fold bumps and it's dark where the fold creases. I also stress this a lot to students. I always tell them have good references. Your references, the quality of your references is super important because your references are your masters somehow. You're gonna follow them. So have good references, 
and you already assure yourself uh, to go somewhere somewhere nice because if your references sucks then you're not going to be able to learn you know the right way okay look at this pants starts to have volume let's save this as today's stream number three that's really the parts i like to paint start to refine start to detail that's really the fun part there are some parts i really don't like construction it's okay but when you have the drawing and you need to lay down the first first layer you need to put a lot of paint because otherwise your brush is going like out of paint and all these kind of things this is annoying but when the construction and the blocking are done and you just start to detail like this that's when i feel like oh, i love painting Sh sharing and spreading the passion you have for art is really important a student will become good eventually if you or if you manage to give him this passion for painting this love this dedication then he will work a lot by himself and he will succeed but if you don't give him this he's not gonna work by himself and maybe he will not succeed as well as if you know he felt this like sacred fire burning inside of him which makes him dig always further and further to progress to keep going and stuff so a good teacher is sharing first his love for painting and second technical tips of course because he's a teacher this morning someone told me what do you do when you feel stuck in what you're doing and my answer was that there are two options or you feel stuck because you have a personal problem in your life let's say or you feel stuck because you're technically having an issue you you feel you cannot move forward or third actually there are three you're stuck in terms of ideas if you are stuck for your for personal issues just put the painting aside fix your life and go back to painting and the block will be off will be away if it's a technical issue think of what's the problem try to analyze what is going wrong or take a course book a mentorship uh, go to see someone in the, uh, some painting in a museum whatever try to find the answer because when you feel blocked technically it's not your work that doesn't look good it's your understanding of what you're doing that is slightly off and then your hand is doing things that are not okay on the canvas and the third one if it's a problem of ideas what you want to do is try to figure out if you maybe have used all the, the the ideas that you have like now what i mean by this is we're all having periods maybe today i'm painting a lot of horses then maybe in six months i'll be painting a lot of landscapes then maybe in a year i'll be painting i don't know uh, boats or whatever and each time you used 100 percent of of the period you're in for instance you've painted so many horses that you don't have any more anything to express through horses then you might feel stuck because you basically explored everything and now you're just turning in circle and you don't have any more ideas because everything you see you already uh, used it in the past so when you're blocked this way just try to challenge yourself and find something beyond for instance you painted horses okay but did you paint five horses in a row or did you paint um, a, a huge city and in the middle maybe you put a few horses you know people riding horses so you have like a huge landscape and inside some horses or maybe you put a horse uh, near the sea so you work on the water effect all these kind of things so by adding new challenges to what you're doing it's gonna make you switch from one period of yours to another and this is gonna help you unlock your inspiration so every time you feel blocked it is actually the sign that you're close to stepping up to to moving forward so it's a good thing in the end that's the sign that you're really close to evolve to move forward here i'm gonna have some reflected light in the dark see the reflected light i put it here it's giving density here it's giving density to the work i mean to the sleeve to the volume here we have the cast shadow of the, of the sleeve. So you see all these details, the cast shadow, etc. I didn't do them at the beginning, but now it's time to add all these parts. A little red because it's influenced by all the red areas around. Jire is asking a really good question. What do I think of people 
who pour varnish on their work. When you're on Instagram, you see a lot of posts where, you know, the, the painting is here and they will pour varnish on it and then just whip it. This is really, really bad practice. For your painting, it's bad. Varnish should be applied thinly, very thinly. If you have this big layer of varnish, it's not gonna dry well, it's gonna stay sticky, it's gonna catch dust and all these kind of things. Even when I called the manufacturer Gambling, because I used a, one of their varnish named Gamvar, which is really good, I called them to have some explanations about the varnish. They said it has to be applied thinly. And I told them, okay, but then what about these people who pour varnish on their work on Instagram? And the guy from Gambling, I mean, the, the person in charge told me it's really bad. Don't do this. I even did a video on this on my Instagram. There's a video about uh, varnishing <laughs> and I do a little joke about this. If you want a really even coat, you need to use a spray. She told me even her, who's a professional restorer, art restorator, I mean, she cannot apply it perfectly equal. So then I now use spray and it's okay, it, it's, it's nice. So this is the leash of the horse with a temperature shift here, you see, from warm. Here we're having an interesting angle. This is also something important. You don't want to go like this. This is very repetitive. Reality is not going to be like this. It, there is always going to be like an angle or, you know, bump or something. So this part compared to this, if you do something like this, you see it's going to look more dynamic. Dynamism is important in a painting. Okay, my friend, the stream is soon to be over. Thanks so much for being here on the stream today. If you want to support my work, don't forget to follow me on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitch here. And what we're recording now is going to be compiled and edited uh, in YouTube videos. So a YouTube channel will be filled soon. The channel is here. You can follow it if you want. The, the link is in my about section. See you soon, guys.